our speaker today is Dr. Jana Allison. She has been in our department of uh, OBGYN since July of 2011. And uh, she uh, got her undergrad uh, education at Missouri Southern State University and her medical school at the University of Missouri in Columbia and her OBGYN residency uh, also at University of Missouri in Columbia. And she's going to talk to us today about uh, HPV, a challenge for every age and gender. Let's welcome Dr. Allison. Well, thank you for letting me come talk to you today about HPV. Uh, our knowledge of HPV is evolving by the day, it seems, and it truly is a challenge for every age and gender. From papillomas of the respiratory tract of infants to adolescents, which is our target group for the vaccination efforts, to uh, women conventionally associated with HPV from cervical cancer, vaginal and vulvar cancers, to men for penile cancers, and then for both genders for oropharyngeal cancers and anal cancers. So the good news is though about HPV related cancers is that the majority are preventable through our vaccination efforts. So let's start by talking a little bit about the virus itself. Human papillomavirus is the most common STD. There are 120 strains of the virus. The majority are um, uh, benign. Um, 80 affect the, the skin and just manifest as just moles or excuse me warts on the skin that are non-STD related. The other 40 affect mucosal tissues, so the oropharynx and the genitalia. It manifests as condylomas or genital warts uh, for infants and children uh, predominantly. It can manifest as papillomas in the respiratory tract, which they can contract through uh, pregnancy with a mom that carries one of the strains that can cause genital warts, six or 11. Uh, for other tissues, it can cause dysplasia. So a precancerous change in any squamous tissue that is infected by HPV, if left untreated for a long period of time, could progress to an HPV-related cancer. So since this is a lunchtime talk, I've edited pictures, so since people are eating. Um, on the right, you see a typical condyloma. So this is uh, on the tongue, but it can be on any mucosal surface. On the left, you have a cervix. And so uh, this might be what you would see on a colposcopy, which is what we do when we get abnormal paps. We look up close with a, a microscope and put some vinegar solution on it to make any abnormal areas turn white. And the area that we really look at is called the squamocolumnar junction. So it's where the squamous tissue of the, the ectocervix meets the columnar tissue of the endocervix, and that's really where HPV likes to live, on the cervix. And so um, the different changes you might see related to HPV is in this bottom left, you get a low-grade CIN, which is cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, or a mild dysplasia. We've got about three different names for each type of manifestation on the cervix, it seems. Uh, on the bottom right, you've got a high-grade CIN, or severe dysplasia and then a cancer in the top right. Um, and with this point, I just want to give a pearl basically to anybody who does cervical exams, that if you ever see a suspicious lesion on a cervix, you don't pap it, you biopsy it, because you can miss a cancer just by papping. So um, HPV is um, rampant. Over 80% of sexually active people will contract at least one strain of HPV at some point, and often more than one strain. Currently over 80 million people have HPV that's recognized and as many of you may know we don't even screen men at this point so likely the number is far greater than 80 million. But the good news is that over 90% of HPV infections will resolve within two years. And this is a question I commonly get from patients. They think once they get HPV they always have it. But the majority do resolve within two years. <laughs> There are certain factors that can increase the likelihood of persistence of HPV. One of them is cigarette smoking. Um, it's, it allows HPV to proliferate and less likely to clear the infection. And then also any compromised immune system, specifically HIV, um, allows it to proliferate. And then over the age of 30, we have diminished immune responses. As far as transmission of HPV, um, other than intercourse, it's basically contact, uh, close skin-to-skin -skin contact of any HPV-infected tissue. Condoms can decrease transmission, but not 100%. And then uh, 
we don't really have evidence that it can be transmitted from toilet seats. That's a question we often get as gynecologists. Um, but as of right now, we don't have evidence that that is true, and uh, neither by shaking hands either. So this graphic just shows a typical HPV infection and how it might progress to a cancer. So uh, step one, you have the virus that enters the cervix through microabrasions, and then over the next few weeks, HPV replicates and, in, and invades the deeper tissue. And then uh, within uh, two years, as I said, over 90% typically will resolve. Now, this point's important. So uh, if HPV persists, it's gonna take 10 years on average to progress to a cervical cancer. And we'll go back to this as we talked about our changes in pap smear screening. We do have a few areas of uncertainty. Uh, we've had patients come in who reliably uh, have not been sexually active nor abused and are HPV positive. And so we don't quite have an answer for that yet, how that may manifest. And then also we have patients who come in who may have had abnormal pap smears in their 20s and then they clear it and then years later come back with another abnormal pap smear but they've been in the same monogamous relationship for 20 years or more so we think there could be a component of reactivation we're just still learning about that process as well and so um, if the HPV infection does persist and over 10 years or more can progress to a cancer, it, basically any mucosal tissue can result in a cancer. And, and thanks to these two actors, discussion of HPV-related cancers and prevention is now more in the forefront of conversations than it used to be, with Farrah Fawcett developing anal cancer and Michael Douglas developing uh, tongue cancer. There are certain strains that are more oncogenic than others for HPV. HPV 16 by far is the most oncogenic, responsible for uh, at least 50% of all HPV related cancers. HPV 18 uh, additionally adds another 20% of cancers. And then there's an additional five strains, 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58, uh, which all together come up with 80% of all cervical cancers. And this is just a, a breakdown of the specific type of cancers um, which HPV is um, the cause for. So anal cancers by far, by far are almost all caused by HPV. So now that we've talked about the burden of disease, let's talk a little bit about screening. Um, everyone's familiar with the pap smear. Um, it used to be every year. So now we have changed our uh, recommendations for screening. So screening for pap smears should start at age 21, no sooner, no matter if they started being exposed to intercourse at 12. I mean, even at an early age, you still start at 21. And even if they've not been sexually active, you still start at 21. Uh, and you continue every three years until the age of 30. And then at the age of 30, you have two choices now. You can continue cytology alone, just the pap smear every three years, or you can add the DNA typing, and that's called co-testing. And if both of those are negative, then you can go five years. Um, and as we're talking about this, I just want to add one important point, that uh, the well woman exam is still every year. You know, you still need a breast exam every year, and still recommend visualizing the, the vulva, the vagina, the cervix every year because there are certain cancers that don't follow these algorithms. There are cervical cancers that are not HPV related. Uh, I recently had a 27 year old with a neuroendocrine tumor of her cervix and um, she had routine screening. And so it, it's really important to still look every year. So, um, why bother co-testing compared to the cytology alone? Um, well, the Kaiser Permanente study is the largest cohort of women we have for cervical cytology and cancer data. And what they found was that when comparing the three-year cytology alone with the five-year co-testing, there's actually a decreased incidence of severe dysplasia by doing the co-testing. The other benefit of the DNA typing is that um, there's another cervical cancer called adenocarcinoma, which is HPV related, which is characterized by skip lesions. And so by uh, papping the outer portion of the ectocervix, you could miss an adenocarcinoma lesion. But if they're positive for 16 or 18, you're going to do further evaluation, you're going to do a colposcopy and biopsy and more likely to detect that kind of lesion. So there is definitely a benefit to the DNA um, typing. 
There's also uh, a new suggestion within our field that maybe we should start with DNA typing alone. And so this is a proposed algorithm. You start with your uh, HPV type, and if it's 16 or 18, you automatically go to colposcopy. Uh, if it's other high-risk variety, you go to cytology. If it's normal, you repeat in a month, or excuse me, a year. Um, and then if it's none of these, then you routine screen again in three years. We talked to our pathologists that have examined our uh, pap smears, and they went back through their data and looked at the number of women who were HPV DNA negative, but had an abnormal result on their pap smear to the point of severe dysplasia. And so what they found is that if we did DNA typing alone, we'd miss at least 6% of severe dysplasia. So we're not really doing this yet, but it's just a, a new option that's being talked about. As far as when you can stop pap smear screening, once a woman has a hysterectomy for a benign indication, fibroids or bleeding, um, and they've had 20 years of normal pap smears, then you can stop her pap smear screening. Or if they reach the age of 65 and have had the 20 years of normal paps as well. For immune suppressed patients, specifically HIV positive patients, you start your pap smear screening at the diagnosis of HIV, even if it's earlier than 21 and no later than 21. And then you do annual pap smears for them, three in a row. And if all three are normal, then you can go to routine screening every three years. Um, but you will continue lifetime for them, even past 65 or after a hysterectomy. Now the question most of you have at this point is, that's great, that cervical uh, cancer screening, we know about that. What about the other HPV related cancers? How do we screen for that? The answer is we don't have an approved way yet. Um, so far I think we're closest to looking for anal dysplasia, which is important because women with severe cervical or vaginal or vulvar dysplasia often have a coexistent high-grade anal dysplasia, which is being missed because we're not screening for it. Or HIV positive patients. One in nine HIV positive patients will have a severe dysplasia. And so it's really important that we start screening for this. And, and the way we do that is sampling the dentate line with either a swab or a brush and sending it for routine cytology like we do for pap smears. As far as the oropharyngeal cancer, we probably get the most questions about that right now. Um, you can go online and you can look for a kit to test for uh, the type of DNA that you might have in the throat. Uh, however, we don't know what to do with that information. So right, or at any given time, about 7% of the population would be positive for oral HPV DNA. And only 1% of those would actually be positive for HPV 16, which is the necessary strain to cause the oropharyngeal cancer. And so screening every sexually active patient for detecting um, less than 1% of squamous cancers in, in the mouth or throat so far doesn't quite um, even out. But I think we're still evolving in our, our knowledge of how to screen for that as well. Uh, for penile cancers, um, we know from the Gardasil study that they had to somehow figure out um, the men that got the vaccine, are they getting HPV, so they had to swab them. And basically the way they did was sandpaper on the, the genitalia and then swabbing. So as you could suspect, most people won't sign up for that for routine screening. <laughs> so uh, we're working on that as well. So beyond screening, uh, when we get a result from our pap smear, we'll talk about that. Um, this app is the greatest. And so uh, basically, you can click on uh, management guidelines, put in your patient's age, their HPV status, their pregnancy status, and their cytology result. Click next, and it will tell you the next thing to do in management. So this is a, an example of an algorithm that will pop up. This is for women over the age of 30 who have a negative PAP but are positive for HPV, and it gives you options and the next step in management. As far as our screening with pap smears, the question is how, how great are we doing? You know, how much um, cervical cancer are we preventing? Well, what we know over the last 30 years, the incidence of mortality from cervical cancer has dropped by 50%. Um, and what we still know is that 12,000 women a year are still getting cervical cancer even with our pap smear screening and 4,000 will die from their disease. So we still have um, a lot of improvement that we could make. Okay, so I'm going to back up on this for a minute. As far as the vaccine goes, many of you probably know that we're targeting adolescents. And the reason is, is because we're trying to catch them before the onset of sexual activity. 
the vaccine will work if they've been exposed to a strain of the virus, um, but the goal is to get them before they've been exposed to any strain. So the question is, what age is that? And so uh, I'm going to poll the crowd here. Uh, what percentage of ninth graders do you think has been sexually active? So A, hopefully none. <laughs> B, 10%. C, 30%. Or D, half. Okay, well, you guys don't have much faith in ninth graders. <laughs> uh, it's actually one in three ninth graders have been sexually active, and by the time they reach their senior year, two-thirds have been. So uh, that's really why we target the earlier age. And um, just to put it in a different perspective, uh, an HPV-related cancer, not just cervical, is diagnosed every 20 minutes, all day long, every year. And so we have a big opportunity, we can make a big difference by increasing our vaccination rates. And so our, our options are basically three vaccines. Um, Cervarix and Gardasil came out about the same time. Cervarix contains 16 and 18, which just to remind you, together come up with 70% uh, of all cervical cancers. But Gardasil added 6 and 11. So those are the two strains that cause genital warts. So there's really no um, interest in giving Cervarix when you could have the added benefit of preventing genital warts. And then happily in 2014, Gardasil added five more strains, the other five that together come up with 80% of cervical cancers. And so uh, this is now available. And this just is a reminder that 6 and 11 cause 90% of genital warts, 16 and 18, 70% of cervical cancers. I included this chart for those who may be skeptical about the preparation of the vaccine and the risks that might be related to that. Um, if you look at the, the adjuvant, there is no thimerosal. Thimerosal has not been used since 2001 in routine vaccines. It's still used in, in some flu vaccines. Um, but uh, for those who think that could increase risk of autism, you can tell them it doesn't even contain thimerosal. As far as the remainder of the vaccine, it contains no live virus of HPV. It's a synthetic capsid protein from the virus itself that makes a virus-like particle. Um, so it is non-infectious can't cause cancer, and there's no preservative in the vaccine. So the target population for Gardasil, uh, we're shooting for 11 and 12 boys and girls because they're typically coming in for other vaccines. We're catching them before sexual activity, hopefully. Um, and uh, as far as why 9 to 26, that was just the original study group. So it could be given past 26, it's just you probably will have to pay for it out of pocket. And um, there's a question of waning immunity, especially that starts to happen after 30. There are three injections for Gardasil, zero, two months, and six months from the first injection. Um, so uh, how efficacious is it? How well does it work? So in women between the ages of 16 and 26, there was a 97% prevention of 16 or 18 related moderate to severe cervical dysplasia or adenocarcinoma in situ. So 97% reduction. For genital warts, 99% protection. For men 16 to 26, 88% efficacy for genital warts. And then for men who had sex with men, 75% uh, protection against anal intraepithelial neoplasia moderate to severe grade. So it does make a huge impact and a huge reduction of the HPV infections. As far as the immune response goes, 99% of people will mount uh, an antibody response to HPV within one month of completing the three-shot series, so it's really important to complete all three. Some questions we have is, should we monitor titers? Could we check titers to see if immunity might be present? So they, you know, do they need revaccinated? We don't know the answer to that. So we don't know what minimal titer is necessary to equal protection. And so far we think the duration of protection is at least 8 to 10 years. Gardasil's been out 10 years, so that's why 10's the longest, but we think it's much longer. And so our progress with um, reducing HPV infections from Gardasil since, uh, or from HPV since Gardasil was started in 2006 is a 56% reduction in teen girls getting HPV. And the caveat of that is that's even with really low vaccination rates. So imagine how many we could reduce if we could get our vaccination rates up. 
And some may choose not to vaccinate for fear of contraindications. There's relatively few uh, if they've had anaphylaxis from a previous vaccine or latex allergy or pregnancy. Um, for women who get pregnant in the middle of their series, you just stop the series and then catch up once they've delivered. And it's okay to give it while they're breastfeeding. The true side effects of the vaccine are the same with basically any vaccine. So pain, redness, fever, headache, muscle pain, and a lot of these are found equal in the uh, vaccine and placebo groups. So uh, I just want to bring up a few um, episodes of misinformation that have been made publicly that have really impacted our vaccination rates. So uh, I remember when Michelle Bachman made this statement in 2011 when she was running for president. She said, I had a mother come up to me last night here in Tampa, Florida after the debate. She told me that her little daughter took that vaccine, that injection, and she suffered from mental retardation thereafter. The mother was crying when she came up to me last night. I didn't know who she was before the debate. This is a very real concern and people have to draw their own conclusions. So a lot of people with a public platform are making very misinformed statements that really are putting a lot of our, our kids at risk. So um, I think it's our job to step in and try to correct that. And this one is a little better. This is from Donald Trump this year. He says, now they want to vaccinate kids as young as 12 years old for HIV. And it's like telling them it's okay to go have sex. It's just disgusting. That's besides the fact that we need to stop all vaccinations until we know what's happening with the autism. So. So uh, with the autism, you can go to the CDC, type in vaccines and autism, and you see a nice um, article that talks about that there's no correlation between any vaccine and autism, despite many studies, um, and that thimerosal has not been used since 2001, and even that has not been associated with autism. Um, but he does, oh, and then also he, you know, put out there that there's an HIV vaccine, and there's not. He obviously meant the HPV vaccine. But he does bring up uh, another point that several parents have expressed concern to me about and is giving the Gardasil vaccine, like giving them a license to go out and have sex. I think it's similar to when we start birth control pills for girls that have heavy periods, you know, and, and we haven't seen a difference in their uh, readiness to have sex after that. Uh, so I really think that, you know, adolescents and young adults are going to go have sex when they decide it's the right time and it's our job as um, providers and parents to just reduce their risk as much as possible. Here's one more. This was in Japan. Um, dozens of girls filed a suit because of constant full body pain uh, after the Gardasil and this resulted a drop in their vaccine to 1%. So um, we definitely don't want misinformation to have that same effect in our culture. Just more information on safety. Gardasil has been studied in more than 44,000 people, and there have been no serious safety concerns identified in these clinical trials. And despite the safety data, uh, only 50% of girls aged 13 to 17 across the U.S. have received at least one dose of the vaccine, and only 33 have received all three doses. Well, I'm going to show you a map. Uh, this is the United States. The dark purple is not good. Um, that is Missouri. So uh, for the number of adolescent girls who received just one dose of the HPV vaccine, we're at less than 49%. And then for boys, dark green, also bad. So we are also there, less than 29% for boys. And some may say, well, we just can't get vaccination rates that high. Well, if you look at the Tdap vaccination rate, we're at 88% nationally. So we have a lot of room that we can improve. And if we could get to above 80%, we could save an additional 53,000 cervical cancers for girls that are currently under the age of 12 in their lifetime. So uh, we really can make a, a better difference than what we're currently making. That was excellent. I will say both my son and